Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, go through a few reasons why you would want to use .NET Core uh, with Astronet ARI, um, and then we'll do a demo uh, and kind of deep dive a little bit into the code and what it uh, does, and then I'll show you guys uh, a little bit more concrete implementation of what something you would want to build using uh, .NET Core and Astronet ARI would look like. So why C Sharp and .NET Core? Um, C Sharp, uh, well, .NET Core is cross-platform, runs on Linux, Windows, and Raspberry Pi now. Uh, it's a statically typed, object-oriented uh, language uh, versus, say, JavaScript or various others. Uh, open source SDK now. Microsoft has open sourced their SDK framework and compiler with Roslyn. Um, so if you're big on you know, open source, Microsoft has taken care of that now. It is the world's most popular IDE, at least according to Stack Overflow survey last year. It has been for five or six years running now. Um, and you are more likely to find more competent, skilled C-sharp developers in the marketplace than you are Node.js. Uh, it's still very new technology, and JavaScript developers are still very much jQuery. So. Um, Astronet Airy was created by Ben Marils. Um, he uh, built it using SwaggerGen, uh, which if you've never used SwaggerGen, it takes a, a typical JSON API and will actually generate code for you. Um, it's, we implemented earlier this year full async await support, so it is multi-threaded now. Um, it's open source. We have support for .NET Framework 4.5, and the recent release this week added support for .NET Standard 1.3. Um, we will be releasing .NET Standard 2.0 uh, support soon. Um, I actually have everything working in 2.0. I just have to submit the pull request and get everything released. So quick background. There's not really a lot um, background-wise. So what I'm going to do is show you guys a quick demo app and a little bit of code. Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. So Astronet um, is simply just a series of .NET APIs for interacting with Asterisk. Um, the old Astronet was written on the AGI interface, I believe. Uh, it may have been AMI, I can't remember. Yeah, and, and so this, this is the new ARI uh, package. So it, it fully implements the ARI spec. Um, uh, Astronet ARI is about two years old. It came out shortly after Asterisk 11 with ARI support. Um, and, you know, I started adding the async await support because I needed async await when I started using their package about a year ago. Are you aware of the old asterisk.net library? No, I'm not. Oh, okay. It was like 2003 to 2010. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So this is the latest and greatest. Yes, this is the latest and greatest. And so this is all .NET Core code. Um, so it's not full framework, so it'll run across just about any platform out there. Um, and basically, this project is a... Will it run in mono? Yeah, yeah, it'll run in mono, um, .NET Core, which honestly, at this point now, there's no reason to use mono um, on Linux. .NET Core is faster, more stable, and officially supported by Microsoft, where mono is not. Yeah, runs in CentOS, and I'll actually show the demo running on CentOS and everything like that. So, um, so we're gonna start. This is just a bare basic .NET Core console application. Uh, nothing really special about it. I've got a couple of variables pre-declared, um, just to shorten things and make it easier for me to type. I'm going to use code snippets. If you've never used them before, I highly recommend it. Um, so I'm going to stick in the main here. So what this is going to do? Let me see if I can. Solidify things here. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up an asterisk uh, ARI endpoint. Uh, this defines where your ARI lives on your asterisk server. Of course, if you want to load balance things and stuff like that, you probably want to look into an asterisk proxy. But I'm not going to cover ARI proxies because they're still a little bit hairy right now. Um, then we create an ARI client. This client is what handles the communication back and forth, both the WebSocket and the JSON API. Um, once that's done, we're basically going to, uh, da, da, da. basically at this point, we're just going to sit and listen and wait for the, the console to terminate. Um, so there's, there's not really a lot here in the main. What we're going to do instead is, uh, sorry, uh, 
Stress, God, on stasis, start. All right. So we have an event hook here that we need um, on client stasis start. So when, and, uh, when a, sorry, when a line connects to the asterisk instance, ARI will fire off the on stasis start event to allow your application to know that a new line has connected to your app. Uh, this will basically answer the call and then it's going to add this just to a, a, a local list so that we know which calls we've answered and so we can handle hanging them up and playing stuff to them. Then I'm going to create an IVR workflow. I'll define that class here in a minute. And that will basically handle that call. Um, and then at that point on, it, this is just gonna re release the workflow back to the, the main thread. So we're, since we're awaiting this, we're not gonna be blocking the thread or anything like that. It'll allow us to handle thousands of calls without any issues here. And then we're going to do the same thing with an end event. And that's a unique channel ID. Yes, yeah, the channel ID is auto generated by asterisk and passed to you. So the channel ID is unique, of course, as long as uh, you don't restart the server. As soon as you restart asterisk, that channel ID will roll back and it may overlap. So, uh, on stasis end. All right. So then on the end event, whenever we, so if someone hangs up before our IVR is finished, um, we want to basically stop whatever we're doing. Uh, basically, we're just gonna call the hang up event just to make sure that we've released our side of the channel as well. And then we're gonna remove that from our channel list. If you were building an actual IVR, you would probably go into more and add cancellation tokens and stuff like that to actually cancel the IVR from running. But in this situation, we're just gonna go simple and basic and we're just going to ignore the fact that the channel doesn't exist anymore at that point. So the last thing we need to do is connect our client. So oops, uh, all right. So we're going to call aryclient.connect. That's going to actually connect us to the ARI interface, and then we're going to wire up our vents. So on stasis. On stasis start. Uh, you find an event like that and you wait for the call back. Have you ever seen one push or send event come back with multiple responses? I'm going to ask to keep questions to the end of the presentation just to keep us on track. No, it's okay. Yeah, and Thank typically you. in C sharp, I haven't run into that problem. So, yeah, it, it's not really an issue. Um, so we're basically binding our two events here. That way we can actually handle when things happen. Um, from this point, I'm going to show you the workflow here. So we're going to create a basic class. It's also going to take in the area client from the uh, main class. We have our channel ID for this uh, workflow, the language. I'm just defaulting it to English to keep things simple. Um, and then a queue of prompts. Once again, we're handling our uh, channel DTMF and playback events here because we actually are gonna be doing some stuff like that. So now here's the thing I've got to figure out. Uh, snippets, uh, IVR events and IVR actions. Mm. All right, so here's the two events that we're handling the ARI on client channel DTMF received event. So whenever somebody presses a button on the phone, we'll get an event fired in our system that will basically tell us what happened. And the ARI client on playback finished event. So this is anytime we play a prompt, we're gonna get a fired event when that prompt has finished playing so that we know we can play the next prompt in the queue. With Asterisk 14, they've added prompt queuing. So you could technically queue up six or seven prompts and it'll just play them back to back. Uh, most of this code was written before Asterisk 14, so uh, I tried to keep it uh, as backwards compatible to the first version of ARI as possible. And then we want IVR actions. All right. And oh, come on now. Oh. Brace in the wrong place the bane of all programmers. There we go. All right. There we go. So, uh, da, da, da. imports, there we go. 
All right, so after our uh, events, we also have a couple of actions that I've added here. Start workflow is called when uh, the call is handled. This basically is just going to create the base menu prompts for me and actually start playing them. The base menu prompts is a simple uh, first in, first out queue. It's in queuing the, the sound files. Uh, if you've never seen the URI like this, this is how ARI accepts URIs for local files. Um, I'm not too familiar with ARI or, AG, or AGI or AMI, so I'm not sure if it looks the same. Uh, and then we've got a couple other actions like start Louie Louie and account, accounting monkeys, stuff that will play based on what action they take in the, uh, the menu. So when they actually choose an event, this channel DTMF switch will, based on the, the digit they choose, determine what happens next. So it's very simple system you can see I mean, it, it, the code is easily extensible easy to build um, and there's not a lot to it you know playing prompts is as simple as just basically telling it play a prompt async on this channel and then passing it the prompt to play so it's nice easy clean to use um, let's see if i actually have sound that's a good question so i'm gonna go ahead and execute this So I'm going to move this over here so you can see that. All right. And I'm just going to use Xlight to dial into this. Uh, and I've got it set up on 8001. Ah, 8001, not 8002. Hello, world. So hard to see or hard to hear, and it's calling the wrong number, 8000. There you go. So and you can see I've got a new call connected, starting the call flow, adding prompts to the queue. It's playing the prompts. Plays the script to Louie Louie. Yeah. So pretty straightforward, you know, bare bones IVR at that point. Um, and as you can see, it, it, it takes literally just a few hundred lines of code to build a very simple IVR in this. So what I wanted to show you next was well, what does this look like when you actually build a full implementation? And how does it look when you um, are trying to build something that you can actually use in production? And so this, this is a sample that I've been working on that's uh, based on architecture that I built for the company I work for, and it's called ARC. Um, it's an open source .NET Core IVR built on Astronet Airy. Uh, I use Simple Injector for inversion of control for an IOC container. Um, uses inlog for logging and has an extensible plugin system. So you can literally write a plugin, drop the binary, the DLL into the directory with it, and then the next startup, it'll just pull those steps. So I'm going to go ahead a little bit into how this works and show you a little bit more about the power of ARI with a full blown system. Yeah, uh, I just uploaded it to GitHub today. And it's on the last slide, the, the GitHub repo. All right, so find my cursor. OK. So ARC is a very uh, heavily architected system. It's very much um, opinionated about how you should build an IVR. Um, so I do encourage you to go out there, check it out. If you want to extend it, build your IVR on top of it, feel free. It's MIT licensed. Um, you can kind of do whatever you want with it. I would recommend one thing that you should do if you choose to use this with .NET Framework instead of .NET Core and you want to run it on Windows, use Top Shelf um, with the Simple Injector IOC container. That way you have a, a much nicer Windows service host. Um, this is just written as a console app so that I could run it across Windows, Linux, or Raspberry Pi, whichever one I wanted to. So once again, you'll see a lot of the same stuff that we had in our other example. The difference is you'll see I've got a logger here. I have the ARI client and the SIP API client. I've actually abstracted away um, ARI into a SIP API so that if for some reason, five years down the road, Asterisk comes along and says, well, no, ARI is gone. Now we're going to ASI. <laughs> and so that way I wanted to be able to easily slot that back in instead of having to rely completely on ARI for the, the history of this project. Um, you can see I've got a plugin directory. This is actually set through a configuration file and overridden if it exists. Uh, if it doesn't, it just uses whatever's here. 
So basically what we're going to do is we're going to register our dependencies. And if you've never seen IOC, this may look a little strange to you, but we're using Simple Injector to register the dependencies. So we have a service client builder, so any steps, and, and I'll go into this concept of what a step is here in a minute, uh, any steps that need to call microservices and stuff like that would uh, inherit from this service client builder and allows you to easily build their uh, interfaces. We have the ARC recording manager, which will allow you to record the calls. Uh, the ARC call flow services, which handles the actual call flow itself. Um, and then the ARC call, which is the, uh, the state engine for each individual phone call that's connected. Uh, we also have some app settings stuff that pulls app settings, and then we actually set up the AR endpoint through this code right here and register the APIs. So this is what I've split the client into is uh, three, six APIs here. Um, one for just plain old SIP API, uh, bridging, line, items, prompts, and recording. It just made it easier for me. As I extend this and drag it out, of course, I'll pull more stuff in. So, what a call flow looks like in this is going to be a little bit different than what you saw in the other one. So I have this asterisk call flow service, or ARI call flow service, our call flow service. And there's our start event. So when a call is connected, we're going to basically, once again, just like before, uh, connect to asterisk, wait for that call. When that call comes in, it's gonna notify us, and if it's dialed or snooping channel, we wanna ignore it. Because basically, when you originate a uh, channel from ARI, you're still gonna get that event that that channel was originated, and so you just wanna ignore that channel, because you, you don't care that you've dialed a number. Um, it, it's nothing that you need to handle, typically, because another thread is already handling that. Uh, and the same thing with snooping channel, so anytime you attach a snooping channel, uh, to a, an existing channel to do recording, you're gonna get another stasis start event because it's still gonna stick that channel into your app. And so, once again, you just wanna ignore that because another thread is already handling that. <laughs> All right, so what we're gonna do, I have a call flow factory that basically handles the spin up of taking that channel and creating all the objects that are necessary. Uh, after that, we're gonna call the run call script, and this is where the bread and butter is. So we're going to answer the call, set up the call start events. This is what handles you know, all your DTMF event setups, stuff like that. We're gonna start a DSL processor, create a file name for the call because like you said, you know, the channel ID is only unique to the first time it started. So you wanna generate something that's actually unique for the long run. And then we're actually gonna start a connection step. So ARC has this uh, concept of steps and there's a DSL that I've built around this. And the DSL is just a simple JSON file that looks like this. So basically what this is, is every step here is reflected through um, C Sharp's reflection engine. So when you spin up the engine, it doesn't actually have any references to device connected, language step, or any of that stuff. All that is created at runtime using reflection and assembly uh, binding. And so you can very easily extend this and not have to add references and stuff like that to the service host. It doesn't actually know what all these steps do. So all that stuff is reflected and lives in a separate binary. Uh, steps. So in the arc.steps project. So inside arc.steps, you can see we've got a bunch of steps We'll take a look at like the input step. So a step inherits from my step processor. Uh, basically, it's just an interface that allows us to very easily reflect and uh, get these items at runtime. Steps have names. This is what it uses to actually comb the JSON and use reflection to pull the information out. Uh, and then when we do the step, we're just basically modifying our call state, firing state changes, and basic business logic at that point. So it's a really extensible, easy to run system that allows you to basically build call flows in JSON instead of in um, you know, either asterisk call flow, uh, uh, SIP, PJSIP, or in uh, ChanSIP. Or, and it allows you to also write this code in C Sharp. So if you're a .NET developer, 
it, it's much, much simpler to write your code in C-sharp than it is to ever try and write it in, you know, asterisk itself. Add to that, you also have debugging. And you can write unit tests, you can write full integration tests. It, it's just much, yeah, it's much easier on your life as a .NET developer than trying to just make uh, asterisk do what you want. So that's basically what I've got for a demo. Um, I can dive further into things if anyone wants. I've got a couple of links here to share. Uh, .NET Core, if you have not installed it already, there are instructions on ASP.NET. Um, or AstroNet.ARI, uh, the main repository is there on GitHub. Uh, ARC was just uploaded today. Uh, the NuGet package for AstroNet is available on NuGet. Um, my Twitter feed and Ben's Twitter feed are available there. So if anybody has any questions after this, feel free to get in touch. I welcome all pull requests to the ARC engine. Um, so if there's anything that you'd like to add to it, feel free. Uh, and if you run into any issues also, feel free to open a uh, work item on there. Um, is there anything? Zach, can I just ask you to uh, open your presentation and change the color on the links to yeah. something a little darker? It's a little hard. Maybe it's just me, but it seems a little hard to see from here. Yeah. Folks yeah. Want, probably want to take a picture of it or, or note it down. Oh, come on now. <clears throat> well. Oh, jeez. Well, let's see. Let's do this. No, that's not going to help. <laughs> Uh, is that any better? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. We've got a fair bit of time, so if anybody has any questions or thoughts or wants to, you know, yeah. start a discussion, then we can definitely do that. That's the, that's the problem with this. It's so easy that it's hard to drag it out to a full 45 minutes because it, it abstracts so much away from you that you don't have to deal with the typical stuff that you deal with day to day. Um, if anyone would like to see, I can show you what is the asterisk uh, config looks like. And if anybody has any questions, feel free. So the extensions conf looks like this. Uh, let me see if I can blow this up a little bit. Uh, uh, settings. Oh, jeez. There we go. Being a Windows developer, have you ever seen Asterisk running on Windows? I have not. I've heard some people have tried to get it to work, but I'm not that much of a sadist. <laughs> so as you can see, I've got three different ARI uh, stasis apps defined here. This is my entire call flow. There's nothing else to it. It's just a simple stasis app and hang up. And so everything else is handled by my .NET code. So as you can imagine, it's kind of a set up once and forget about it for the rest of your life. <laughs> And then I can actually show you running all this. <laughs> Let's see. And all of this also works completely in dot, on uh, Linux. So this is a Linux VM, by the way, CentOS 7, uh, running on Hyper-V. Zach, we have a question over oh, here. Go for it. So well, does it help with the tenant transfers as far as keeping the channels together like CEL does? So I haven't actually written in transfer uh, code yet. Um, there is support for it in ARI, and so it's also in Astronet ARI. Uh, ARC has not, where, we, where I work at Paytel Communications, we typically don't do phone transfers, um, and so it's just not a functionality that I've used yet. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it should be fairly easy to implement and add that to it. I have a question. Sure. Do you have a roadmap for this that that sort of outline some of the functionalities that you'd like to add, or do you have a place where people who are interested can provide you with feedback with functions that they? Absolutely, on the GitHub, there's a short roadmap of the features that I'm uh, planning on implementing kind of next. Um, after that, if there's any features or functionality people want, uh, 
simply just create work items in the GitHub repo and I'll help prioritize them with the community um, and, and get them implemented as quick as possible. Uh, I'm definitely looking to try and make this something that is easy to use, powerful, and is something that delivers a lot of value to the community because it's something that I needed when I started working where I'm at and there was no project out there to do something like this. Um, so to show you it running on Linux, just to prove that it does work, I'm just going to run .NET run. I've actually already run .NET restore and .NET build on here. Um, basically that will handle restoring the NuGet packages and compiling the code for me. .NET run will actually execute the code. Yeah. And then there we go. So we have container, dependencies, everything up and running. And at this point, we have a full-blown IVR running on Linux written in .NET Core. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Have you looked into or tried doing like a voice recognition in your IVR? Uh, I have not yet. ARI, when I first started writing this, didn't support voice recognition yet. I'd like to try and implement that because it's something that we need as well. Um, we currently use a third-party service to do that, and so it would just simply dial out of our current system into that system and then get a response from their API. Um, I would like to do that natively through ARI if that's possible. Uh, the other thing that's missing right now is text-to-speech um, because ARI doesn't support it out of the box. Uh, I'll probably look into building um, a, a simple web service that will be hosted with this using uh, .NET Core self-hosted services that will integrate the um, uh, AWS uh, Poly API to do text-to-speech and then generate the audio so that it can be passed to asterisk because with uh, 14 it, they added the capability of passing a URI through, uh, for playback so you can just simply pass a full HTTP string to playback an audio file. AMD? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question about production environment yep. and using the, the, the REST API. Are you hosting this kind of uh, .NET service into a different server and commanding a lot of asterisks, or are you deploying w with the asterisk server? So what we're currently doing today is we are hosting our asterisk instances on VMs uh, using CentOS 7, and then we deploy our Arc instances in Docker containers and wire it up that way. Our end goal would be to deploy a ARI proxy that would allow us to, say, have 15 asterisk servers with only a three of the ARC servers, because the throughput that ARC can handle is much, much greater than what asterisk can. Um, and so I, I should be able to theoretically control multitude of servers with a single instance of ARC. Uh, and, but the ARI proxies aren't quite there yet. They're still very much in like alpha stages. Uh, there's still a lot of glitches and hinks in them. They don't, they're not very stable. Um, so as they, as they grow more stable, I'll be migrating this code to support the ARI proxy as well. Thank you. Yep. So these are hyper-V, centralized. Yeah, I'm, everything that we run, well, on our, our production framework, we run everything in VMware. Um, on my laptop, VMware doesn't like me, so. <laughs> <laughs> I just run Hyper-V because with Windows 10 it's just easier. And then I'm running CentOS 7 as the uh, asterisk host. And then on top of that, I, I run Docker instances. This will run in Docker Windows or Docker Linux, either way. Uh, that's the nice thing about .NET Core. You can compile it just about anywhere you want. <laughs> you said VMware versus Hyper-V. Like, either there's a reason or there's a personal vendetta. Just curious. Oh, so personally, I have a vendetta against VMware because they have caused us issues in the past. Um, and it's stuff I'll cover if you want to talk about it offline. But uh, Hyper-V, to me, it just works easier in Windows 10. VMware's uh, vSphere client has given me issues in the past uh, on my local machine. So and it may be a Dell thing as well. So. So we use Hyper-V for all of our virtualization. Yeah. 
you said VMware, and I'm thinking, yeah, is there a reason why? No, it's just uh, that's what the infrastructure guys that I work with chose back when they first set up the infrastructure about eight years ago, yeah. and Hyper-V at that point in time was still basically a, a yeah. <laughs> so we just haven't done the migration yet. Yeah, well, I mean, if anybody wants to see anything else running, feel free to stop me. Thank you, guys.